I don't know how many of you know what happened to me in 2007. But long story short, I'm from Australia and I was on holidays in Bulgaria visiting my friends when I witnessed about 15 drunken neo-Nazis shout racist slurs, chase down and attack a boy with darker skin. The victim was most probably of Roma ethnicity. After I successfully protected the victim from death or serious bodily injury, the gang attacked me. I was knocked out and I don't remember what happened, but suffice it to say I had a knife to protect myself and one of the gang members had died. The parents of the deceased, as well as the parents of the other gang members, were extremely connected people. They referred to themselves as the elite of Bulgaria. The investigation and the sub subsequent trials became heavily corrupted because of that. Despite overwhelming evidence that I intervened to save somebody's life, I was convicted for something like premeditated murder and sentenced to 20 years maximum security prison. Last year, I was lucky to get a panel of judges who were above corruption, and I was released early from prison after having served 12 years of my sentence. However, the corrupt Bulgarian government has continued holding me here illegally in Bulgaria now for almost a year with no end in sight. They are simply refusing to take my name off a ban list of people who cannot leave the country. Many times I've been asked, how had I stayed sane through 12 years of prison and almost a year now being held illegally by the Bulgarian government? I think it all boils down to moral choice I had to make on the night in 2007. I think of it as something similar to asking children hypothetical moral questions in a classroom or around a family barbecue. Brain teasers that are designed to test people's morality, often between an evil solution and less evil solution. Some moral conundrums are easier than others to answer. And of course, morality is subjective, but generally across different cultures, we come to the same conclusions as to what is right or right action in a difficult situation. Now, when presented with this situation as a hypothetical moral conundrum, most people would say, well, the correct thing is to help the boy being attacked by the neo-Nazis. But when that happened to me in real life, people were less united in their responses. This is where the hypothetical moral dilemma becomes more complicated when it meets reality. People are not so quick to answer when there is a possibility of yourself or the attacker dying if you chose the morally correct option. Hypothetical questions are easy to answer, but harder to practice, especially so when there is a possibility of great sacrifice. Often these gangs murder their victims with many witnesses and bystanders. On the following morning, in various TV news shows, there are always lots of friends and family of the deceased, and the first question everybody asks is, why didn't anyone do anything? Although there were people shouting at the police in America, still not a single person stopped the police from murdering Mr. Floyd George. When I watched the video of the murder of Mr. George, the only question that was going through my mind was, why are people just watching? Why is no one stopping them? Probably if just one person had pushed the policeman off Mr. George, he wouldn't have been murdered. When I saw the neo-Nazis attack the boy, I thought about how I would feel if the neo-Nazi gang murdered this boy, and they had murdered him in front of me because of the color of his skin. What would his parents say? What if this boy was one of the friends, one of my friends? and someone was attacking my friend for nothing less disgusting than racism. How could I live with myself knowing for the rest of my life that I had an opportunity to save the life of this boy and I didn't use it? It was an existential question. And I'm a big believer in the saying, bad things happen when good people do nothing. If I didn't help this boy in his moment of need, what right would I have to expect or to ask for help in my moment of need? Too often, people renounce the personal responsibility that we have for one another. I was not the only one who watched the gang attack the little boy. There were maybe another 30 people also watching. None of them chose to intervene to save the life of the victim. For me, it was a question also of freedom, because I believe there is no freedom without responsibility. So if I am to be free, then I must be responsible to myself, but also to those around me. I made my decision in what now feels like the blink of an eye. I was successful in the sense that I saved the boy being attacked by the gang but unfortunately one of the attackers was killed. I was arrested, and despite the gang also having attacked the police, not one of them was even ever detained. Immediately, the entire media apparatus in Bulgaria clicked into action to exonerate the gang and demonize me. There was every possible crazy story, from me being a terrorist to being a drug addict intent on stabbing rapid people whilst looking for drugs. These lies were repeated in every newspaper, on every TV channel, every radio station hourly for the first five years of my court proceedings. It was tremendous psychological pressure that I think would have driven most people mad. 
It is surreal to know what really happened, but the entire world is saying that you're lying. I guess my, my, my word of caution here is that we rely almost completely on the media to inform our opinions of people and events. But this only works with free and pluralistic media that engage in responsible journalism. In Bulgaria, however, the barrage of lies and the same lie was being copied and pasted from one media source to another without a single journalist bothering to check if the information was correct or not. This brainwashed an entire generation of people in Bulgaria about me and what happened in 2007. In the call to public opinion, I was the sociopathic foreigner who needlessly attacked a peaceful group of youngsters and brought about the death of one of them. While the media was making slanderous claims about me in my case, they didn't even spell my name correctly for the entire 12 years of my incarceration. They didn't even check basic facts. It was a very conscious propaganda campaign, and the people leading it knew that they couldn't control non-Bulgarian language media. So the people connected the people connected with the Nazi gang and their parents never once spoke to independent or objective media, never once spoke with international news journalists. Eventually, as more people outside the Bulgaria started asking questions, there were two versions of the story that emerged. One version reported in Bulgarian language, where I was still a monster, and a completely different one reported in English or any other language other than Bulgarian, where it was acknowledged that I came to the rescue of an innocent person in great danger. It wasn't until 2019, when after years of asking, my lawyer and friend Kalim Angelov was finally able to obtain security camera footage of the area where the 2007 incident took place, that people in Bulgaria started realizing that my side of the story was the true one. Up until that point, the psychological pressure was so great that it was difficult to explain. Sometimes it felt like the lies were designed to manipulate the general public, but at other times it felt like the mass propaganda was actually made to try and convince me that I was the person they said I was. This is known as gaslighting. This brings me back to the question I often get. How did I stay sane? And it all goes back to the fundamental question of morality. Is it correct to beat and kill people because they have darker skin than yourself? The answer, of course, was simple, but this was unacceptable to allow new Nazi gangs to attack and murder people in front of your very eyes. Sanity for me for the next 12 years after I intervened, and even still today, became intrinsically connected to the basic morality that people shouldn't be attacked because of their skin color. It is hard for me to be talking about these things because I feel stupid having to say that we shouldn't be attacking people because they have different color skin than us. But what a lot of people need to know is that this is not a universally accepted moral principle. It isn't even a question of subconscious racism. It is open, overt, and normalized for many people and not just in Bulgaria, but of course around the world. Unfortunately, many people like to leave morality in the, in the realm of the theoretical. But for me, it had very practical implications. And how I spent my time in prison always went back to what got me there in the first place. If I was going to oppose racism on the street, then I had to defend that principle by the way I lived in the place where I was being judged for it. The way I saw it, anything I did or didn't do in prison would reflect back the moral choices I made back in 2007. And the prison environment reflected pretty much the same street environment of the attack in 2007. Even the most sympathetic prison staff still thought of me as an idiot for having gone to the rescue of someone, especially a Roma person. They thought even if I was morally correct in terms of opposing racism, the act of actually doing it came with such a high price that it wasn't worth it. Or even worse, there were racist prison management who thought I was naive to help someone of Roma ethnicity, and yet others called me a race traitor. But if I gave up on my beliefs now, then really it would have made all the suffering for nothing, which I suppose would have been the biggest punishment of all. Despite the stereotypical portrayal of prisons in the media and cinema, where prisoners sit around planning crimes and violence, the public still has a general idea that people are supposed to be changing for the better, and thus leaving prisons more socialized than when they had entered prison. This, however, is based on the premise that those running the prisons are morally superior or more socialized than those being sent there. What people don't understand about prisons is that very often the staff who run the prisons are more morally corrupt than any of the people sent there. Never before in my life had I seen people deprived of even the most basics of morality. Many listening now might think I'm speaking about the other prisoners, but I am not. I'm speaking about the staff. The best way I can explain prison is to describe it as a living death. It is like being at your own funeral. Friends and family and society as a whole 
have some period of grieving, but then move on and the prisoner is forgotten. But that didn't mean those of us in prison had to forget ourselves or each other. This is what motivated me to start the Bulgarian Prisoners Association, the first and so far only organization to protect the rights specifically of the incarcerated in Bulgaria. During my 12 years in prison, every day my moral values were tested. For example, when a prisoner was tortured by guards and he asked me for help after, I was reluctant because I knew it would mean the guards would exact revenge on me. It took me about 30 seconds to tell myself, you're not yourself when things are going good. You show your true colors only when you are afraid. In a way, it was exactly because I was afraid that I knew that I had to help this person. Because if I didn't, it would mean that the terror inflicted by these types of people had been successful. It had achieved its goal, the goal of breaking solidarity between people that extends back to thousands of years, even to the story of the Good Samaritan. It was a similar feeling and thought process to the fight in 2007, that through fear and intimidation, they want people to turn their backs on the most basics of morality, to not help this prisoner who had been tortured would mean to renounce the very person I believed I was. It meant to renounce my very existence. If I didn't help this man after he was tortured, I wouldn't know who I was anymore. I use this particular man's case as one example, but obviously, as part of the Bulgarian Prisoners Association, I have had to deal with many similar cases of injustice being done to the disadvantaged and vulnerable in prisons. I have witnessed fellow prisoners being misled or outright lied to about their basic rights, with often dramatic consequences. I was put in prison for helping a person persecuted by the elite. The elite. And the idea was to not only terrorize me into, into not challenging the hegemony of this elite, the message was clearly made to Bulgarian, to Bulgarian people as well, that these people from the ruling elite could not be opposed. They were and, and are allowed to do anything they want, even to the point of attacking anyone they choose. This message was repeated in prison, that for any disagreements with the prison management, no matter if they were legitimate or not, then that prisoner would be persecuted to the fullest extent possible. The problem I had was that if I was standing on morality to get to prison, the point I was making against racism would be lost if I was to renounce morality in the name of selfishness and self-protective individuality in prison. In the prison, I was told regularly by the staff to think only about myself. It was even like a slogan in Bulgarian prisons. We are only responsible for ourselves, I was told. It was a mantra that the staff used to break social responsibility, both with regards to interprisoner solidarity, but also to renounce the responsibility the prison staff had to each other and to the prisoners. It was a constant temptation to give up helping or caring about other people and to think only about myself. Almost a daily struggle in my mind and heart and the pressure was incredible. You see, prison is an artificial, despotic, surreal world where very little of what happens makes much sense. But passing through the prison gates and entering prison did not make me a different person. There wasn't a magical barrier that I passed that changed the person I was or how I acted. There were people who justified their actions to me by saying, here is prison. To me, this was like childish school playground psychology, a type of mass psychosis. And so I tried to be conscious and vigilant, not to succumb, succumb to peer pressure or to the very low standard of social pressure. If something is morally correct, just because you're being bullied doesn't change the fact that it is still morally correct. Borders, no matter how constrained, still allow for a moral choice to act or to not act. If you are on the street, confronted with a person needing help from a mob or in a prison, the choices and responsibility always remain yours. Originally, I hadn't planned on mentioning the current pandemic, but it occurred to me, having listened to other people, that for some people, self-isolating in their homes is really difficult for them. For me and for prison activists, I think this is a good time to remind everyone that this is what prison is like for an estimated 10.35 million prisoners around the world. Another thing I'd like to mention on the topic is the incorrect use of the term social distancing. I have no idea how this term became so popular internationally because what we are doing with regards to the global pandemic isn't social distancing at all. It's physical distancing. Social distancing is the purpose prison serves. We are not socially distancing during the pandemic because we still have social interaction, even within our similar, even, even within our smaller group of, of friends or family or online. Prisoners are truly socially distanced, especially here in Bulgaria, where prisoners are only allowed two 40-minute visits behind glass a month. Not only that, but the prison administration on purpose keeps families and friends waiting outside the prison 
in the cold or the heat for up to three hours. The government is currently building a new prison that is hours away from any city, and so the social distancing continues. If we consider that prisoners are people who have been antisocial, how do people, politicians, judges, or prison staff think that these people will be able to reintegrate into society by being in an environment that doesn't resemble either the general society or a healthy environment? We take people who we say are sick and then put them in a space and experience that is either even sicker and then we expect them to heal. We need to end social distancing and to do the opposite by bringing back offenders into society, not by pushing them further away. Part of social distancing are the media exaggerations and sometimes outright lies. Not only that, but it is, a const it is constant and probably never ending, making social integration harder or impossible. But I also believe, and I still believe, that a large part of the hostile media campaigns and persecution against me personally in the prison was to push me to a breaking point where I would lash out. And then those who had invested so much time and effort in securing the decision of the kangaroo court would say, see, we told you so. We told you Jock was a bad guy. And again, how I reacted to these tabloid journalists would be my choice. So I had two important things to remember. Not to renounce the person I was and also not to become the monster I was trying to be. So I made a conscious effort not to change whilst I was in prison. I did my best at forgetting that I was in prison and instead looked at the world around me as any other. I was still a person and the people around me were still people. It will sound like a cliche, but an extract from what is known as the prayer of serenity, I believe is extremely important philosophy. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Every time I was confronted with a problem or dilemma, I had two choices, to do something or to not do it, not, or, to, or to do nothing. There is no third option. The decision not to do anything is also a conscious act. Maybe most of us are afraid at times to do the right thing. Maybe only idiots are not afraid. The consequences could be drastic. For example, I know of a similar situation in Australia where a man protected someone being attacked by new Nazis and he himself was killed by the attackers. But the way I cope with the fear is to think of myself in the future, looking back at myself and judging myself, judging the actions I took or didn't take when confronted with a dilemma. The fear of doing what is right will have long been forgotten. But the regret of having the opportunity to have helped someone in their time of need and not having acted would be with me for the rest of my life. Again, there are only two choices, to do something or to do nothing. There is no third option. Thank you very much for listening to this. Story.